well, without being essentialist, you were born in the Bronx in New York, yes. um, now live in the Los L.A. area. How do these two metropolis, how yeah. have they shaped your thought? Well, the Bronx definitely shaped my, I mean, mm -hmm. I was a geographer when I was eight, mm -hmm. even before I knew what the hell that was. I just loved knowing about the rest of the world, particularly cities. Uh, and, and that came out from the densities of the Bronx. The stimulus of density is very clear in, in my life. Uh, my interest in space, I, I some, I've been wanting to write this up, it sort of relates in some ways to the games we played in the streets in New York. Mm -hmm. That certain times of the year and certain places we played marbles, <laughs> with marbles, other flipping cards, other balls and handballs and stickball and, you know, the, the, the learning the into every every space on my one street and the street corner that I lived on. You know, this was a very small space. I knew everything uh, about this tiny space. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was sort of thrilling. Uh, part of the thrill of childhood uh, was playing this game of four corners and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yes, the Bronx was very influential on me. And I frequently... Uh, after spending so much time in Los Angeles. Los Angeles people ask me, do you like living in Los Angeles? And I refuse to answer. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I've just been living in Los Angeles. Intellectually, it is one of the most fascinating cities on earth. There's things keep happening in Los Angeles that keep my intellectual interest going. But living in, there's so much in Los Angeles that I don't like. Even in Orange County, I mean that was oh. that, 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 that was fascinating when you said that Orange County is a buzzing, bustling center. Well, yeah, but but boring as hell in other ways too, uh, and, and it's out of that you know, the the boredom of excessive buzz mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, is is a peculiar thing, uh, a, a, a kind of j my children. No, if I would predict growing, having children grow up in Los Angeles, I would say it's a disaster. Uh, so much access to all kinds of things, drugs and everything else, and crime. Both of my kids have grown up to be really good. They may have experimented, but they, they, they just, you know, they don't care. But yet, they, in a way, they were both jaded, male and female. They saw everything. And they chose not to do the bad things. Uh, and they're really good 30, late 30s, early 40-year-old mm -hmm. adults. I mean, they're really good human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happened in Los Angeles. And they did it. Each of them had a whole friends network that were people like that. Uh, and so I don't know what it is that, it was, that that's something that there is also this positive force in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Uh, that works, but uh, it's inexplicable to the outside. I, I have developed a much stronger, for a variety of reasons, antagonism to New York uh, and New York styles and New York domination, as I was mentioning yeah. before, kind of New York bias in so many areas. Uh, it's and intellectual arrogance. It's an intellectual arrogance. That what's even worse is, I mean, for example, there's a big debate going on between a so-called uh, whatever, L.A. school versus a New York school of urban analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're completely different. L.A. tries to understand the city so that we can understand what's happening in cities around the world. New York, everything in New York is unique. And all we want to know is to celebrate how different in New York is. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, com that's just the opposite of what the, the L.A. people are studying. Mm -hmm. Uh, inward looking, uh, doesn't care about uh, other cities. You know, New York is just this unique place that's fantastic and above all else. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything is done, that's the arrogance, and, 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 and everything is done to reinforce it. Now, one last question about your latest book, uh, Seeking Special Justice. Um, you, you discussed the basic distribution or the right to um, democratic existential speciality, to use your terms. And it seems that it resonates a lot with other um, um, democratic uh, struggles for the distribution of land uh, from the European point of view, the agrarian reform or the Saint-Terre movement in uh, Brazil, in Latin America, 
or even the critique of this soil nationalism in Israel that is going on with the state. You know, the, um, so I, uh, uh, I was thinking whether you consider that your defense of this right to uh, a democratic uh, spatiality mm -hmm. follows in this long line of, of course, different, uh, geographically different, politically different uh, struggles, but whether it follows in this. The answer is in part, problem. yes, mm -hmm. the, the, that I, and I like the way you put it, this mm -hmm. right to democratic spatiality, mm -hmm. which I never quite just used that, those words, but I, I sympathize entirely with that. Uh, the difference has to do with the level of consciousness. Uh, and it's also related to everything I was saying today that, yeah, if you press people, they're going to say, yeah, it has to do with space and cities and land and whatever. Uh, but there's a big difference between consciously using spatial strategies for organizing, demonstrating, identity formation, social action, legal cases... Uh, consciously using the spatial uh, is what I'm trying to encourage. I don't think, uh, for example, I, I talk about the, what I call the, the Israeli occup occupied Palestine uh, as a form of spatial injustice by the imposition of a colonizing of space uh, in, in, in a variety of ways. With the generals, by the way, sitting and talking about Derrida and, and uh, its astonishing film. How do they react? Uh, they they say, well, this is, we must know this because this is the only way we can understand the complexities of the urban. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're, they're taking the urban theorists very seriously mm -hmm. and using the spatial, using Said and Derrida and uh, Deleuze and my work mm -hmm. uh, and using it for the terrible purposes, which is always possible. They realize the power of space. Uh, as generals, you know, ge geography says that they both de la guerre, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they understand the power of space, and so they read those people who write about space and power. Do you think that your theory is out of control once you create it, that it can be appropriated? Oh, well, that's that's the famous uh, Derrida question, yeah. I guess, uh, and I won't answer as Derrida <laughs> first answer, which is I'm not responsible for how people use my theory. I, I, partially, I am. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's why I insist on this clear spatial consciousness uh, and, and, and the idea that, that it can be misused and co-opted uh, and the idea is to, is to try to find its roots of power to, to use it in a, in a positive way uh, and, and partly it's why I don't abandon Marxism uh, at one level, I've moved away from the, the kind of absolutism that says you can only be 100% Marxist. I believe you can be 30% Marxist, 40% uh, Marxist. Uh, so I retain uh, Marxism in what I do, uh, and it helps me with the political uh, part of what I do. Uh, but to sort of sit and depend entirely on the Marxist interpretations just unacceptable to me. Uh, it's not going to help us understand globalization, no matter how brilliant Marx was in, uh, in the Communist Manifesto about capital globalizing. If you depend entirely on that, you really miss too much. Uh, and which is um, it's a comment about my great friend David Harvey, uh, who now teaches globalization by having people read only the Communist Manifesto. Which is clearly insufficient. Which is brilliant, which is fantastic, but it's not, not, enough. not enough. Thank you very much for your okay. brilliant talk today and for this interview. Thank you. A pleasure. <laughs>